have yes ma'am i see you i see you i see you so folks how's everybody doing it's about oh wow 11 past a half i can just yap 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 in. I want to say good evening and welcome to the show. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, as always, I always start off by saying thank you for spending your Thursday nights with me. For all the things that you could be doing, or of all the things you could be doing, you choose to be here week in, week out. And for that, not only am I truly humble, I'm moved. Um, my name is Hank Batiste. My show is called Omethologic. This shit makes no sense. So last week, my show was canceled because I just anticipated having power issues. And we still have some blanks. Uh, you might call rolling blackouts or, or something like that. But it's not like a New York or, or, or L.A. blackout where we're they're scheduled or and what have you. Some of this is because some people are still um, coming online, coming back online. And when they when they do that part of the power grid it affects another part of the power grid so while they're restoring someone else's power my power is temporarily interrupted so um let's just play this by ear and hope that we get through this without any problems i didn't have a show last week this week we got a show i posted something very early this morning and basically what i posted i asked a few questions and the thing that's been on my mind, we got about 32 days, 32 days, 32 days to the midterm elections. And I wanted to just get a, a feel. I wanted you guys to participate. Maybe I should have done it. I'm going to do it again. So I'm giving you a heads up. I'm going to ask you again next week or this coming week. What's important to you? What's important to you? One of the things that I'm learning from these young kids is they kind of ignore the chatter. They ignore the propaganda, and they focus on the things that are near and dear to them. And I've had conversations with some young people, and they say, how can you defend a system that is so severely broken? And... I laugh because when I was a student at Howard, I had, and I'm working at Bethesda, I had the sheer honor of meeting people like Colin Powell and Thurgood Marshall. And Thurgood Marshall was, that was my Academy Award, my Tony, my everything, because when I look at all that's happening with the Supreme Court today, I said, we need uh, somebody dynamic, like a third good, who's truly a public servant, to take up some of these issues that are coming before this so-called conservative, I call it a biased Supreme Court. Because when you use terms like conservative to me, I'm conservative and, and though I look like, a, you know, somebody told Amazon I was home alone and I'm just wantonly spending money, I plan my expenditures because I'm on a fixed income. But even when I was making money, I still did the same thing. I was splurged from time to time because I knew that I had money coming in. But by the same token, what I always did is I had to, I was raised to plan for a quote unquote a rainy day. So I was talking to um, some young people and they say, how can you defend a system that's so severely broken? And I remember asking General Powell, Colin Powell said, how could you be a Republican when you're probably one of the people that they despise most? And he said, it's easier to change a system when you're part of it. And I looked at him and I was saying to myself, but you're one person. And then I, I did realize that there were a lot of people that admired him 
that might take follow his lead. But then for some reasons that are beyond me, he chose not to pursue public office, even with all of that fanfare that followed him. Um, then when I met Thurgood Marshall, and I've told you guys this story before, so I'm not going to be redundant and tell it again because people say, I'm like Uncle Remus, and, and I tell these stories over and over. But I tell the stories over and over because some people haven't heard them. And sometimes because it, 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 it just reminds me of the goodness that's in people. When I met with the Honorable Justice Marshall, he had just been, he had just removed himself from the Supreme Court. And I won't say replaced by Clarence Thomas, because I feel like nobody could fill his shoes. You know, the things that this man did, you know, Brown versus the Board of, of Education, Plessy v. Ferguson, and on and on and on. The things that he did was so phenomenal that we don't, we don't understand it. And what's worse, when I talk to young people, I say, you guys don't understand the sacrifices that people like Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King made. And to me, it's a badge of honor that I, I carry. You know, us, those of us who are old enough to get these stories firsthand, those of us who are old enough to remember where we were, where we were when, you know, we heard from our, our our parents and the first time my mom took me into Cross department store and tell me, you know, we can sit at the lunch counter now and I'm and I'm I'm like, my that doesn't matter to me. It's a hamburger. And she said, No, son, you don't understand. And now being a grandfather, being an elder, trying to convey this to the kids, I understand that it's Something that I hold near and dear, but it's also something that holds me back because there's an inherent fear that goes along with that. When you're young, you feel you have the impotence of youth on your side. You feel invincible. You feel like you can overcome anything. So... When I listen to young people talk, I'm reminded of how I felt when I listened to Thurgood Marshall. I'm reminded of how I felt when someone as distinguished as General Colin Powell told me that you, it's easier to change the system when you're part of the system. So don't get me wrong, I'm not defending this broken system that we call democracy. I'm not defending this broken system that we call voting. What I, what I fear is what if they were no more? So when I pose these questions to you guys, and I know, I know on one hand, I give you the, uh, I, I say a pass because we've been so overwhelmed with this. We've been so inundated we've been so our consciousness has been so bombarded with this week in and week out for the last two years that went down to 32 days but we're all tied out we're tired of talking about it we're tired of seeing the propaganda whether it's from me or wolf blitzer or whomsoever and I said, what would, some people say, what would Jesus do? When I find myself trying to report a story, I said, what would Walter Cronkite say? Because he had a way of giving you just the facts. And when I try giving just the facts, this little thing called heart and soul and emotion and those memories of the Thurgood Marshalls, the Martin Luther Kings, the Malcolm X, the John F. Kennedys, and the so forth and so on. 
That's why I give you guys, you know, the human side of me. So you don't just see me as somebody standing over you, browbeating you with this political nonsense. You hear it everywhere. I get it. But I, I want to ask you a question. Right now it's rhetorical, but I want you to think about it. And I want you to respond to it the next time I post it on my page. What are you willing to fight for? Because like, like it or not, we are in a fight for our lives as we know it. We're in a fight for what we pass on to our children and our grandchildren. And I promise you, looking at the people that are online with me now, the one thing that we all have in common is we all have more days behind us than we have ahead. So I do this. I could lay back. I could travel. I could not be chained to this desk in these computers and doing the research and what have you. But I'm fighting for those that can't fight for themselves. So I'm asking you, what is it that you're willing to fight for? And the second part of that is this. Tonight's show is about why doesn't fear politics work for Democrats? Because in my recent memory, fear politics became part of the Republican game plan to get people elected. It came to a head with Lee Atwater and George H.W. Bush, but it's been a, a part of the democratic process ever since. And it's more prevalent now than it's ever been before. But the truth of the matter is, and I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again, I'm not a Dem, I'm not a Republican. I'm a political thinker. And I tend to align myself with the party because, unfortunately, in our country, independents don't get elected. They don't have the name. Even of Ross Perot, he had the name and the money, but he could not get elected. So I align myself with those people, and that's why I'm so hard on Nancy Pelosi and, and, and just as hard as I was on Trump. Because I know history, and I know that Democrats, time and time and time again, going back to the presidential race of 1876, and what was once called the Great Compromise, where the final count, the popular count, the popular vote for president ended up in a dead heat. And the Democrats and the Republicans went in the back room and they made some concessions. The Republicans said that they would give up the White House to the Democrats if the Democrats would just hold up on this thing that we called integrating us into the political process after being freed as slaves. They call it reconstruction. So the Democrats sold us out with reconstruction to have their candidate placed as president. And then we fast forward to 1976 when Jimmy Carter was elected. The peanut farmer from Georgia, a Democrat who had Andrew Young and placed him in this position where he was supposed to do so much. But unbeknownst to most, Jimmy Carter was the one who had a study done 
called the darkening or the blackening of America. And what this study, this social science study, determined that by the year 2000, white people would be a minority in America. So the fear of politics didn't start with Ronald Reagan, and it really didn't start with Jimmy Carter. Because remember, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was what? A Republican. But I don't understand why the fear does not work for Democrats. So what are you willing to fight for? What is it that you say, this is it? Is it abortion? Is it inflation? Is it the ability to buy a house? Do you think about your children being able to buy a house? Your grandchildren? Is it your legacy? What is it that you're willing to fight for? My name is Hank Batiste. This is on Mythologic. This shit makes no sense, folks. This shit makes no sense. Some people are willing to fight for abortion. That's what seems to be moving women to the polls. And I heard this 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 newscast, and I don't want to call her name out because you know people have a tendency to say things and they don't see it as being racist. They don't see it as being sexist. They just see it as the way that they feel. But she said something to the effect that if men can't get it right, let's elect women. I say Hillary Clinton is a woman. Nancy Pelosi is a woman. And so on and so on and so on. So just being a woman doesn't mean that you're going to do. Matter of fact, there's just as many women who are anti-abortion as there are men. But the thing that, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent. I always talk about how, how, how women of color jump on the bandwagon as soon as you say woman. But when it's a woman of color that's being attacked, and most recently, the newest justice to the Supreme Court, Justice Jackson, Katanji Jackson, where are women who lack color? Where were they when she needed someone to fight for her? So yeah, I said it, and I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it again. Stop coming to every everything that, that comes up that says woman isn't about you. Don't make it about you. Fight for things that save your energy, save that for issues that are near and dear. That's going to affect not only your daughters, but your sons as well. Because as long as they can divide us in woman, man, okay, I said I wasn't. And I'm going to leave it alone. So, young folks, they seem to be moved by inflation, gas prices. I call it quality, quality of life issues. So if you're not moved by abortion, if you're not moved by quality of life, why are you not moved by voting rights? So many people say, well, that's why I don't vote, because it doesn't work. If voting did not work, why are they trying so hard to stop us and nullify our vote? I can't say that enough. So you're not willing to fight for abortion, you're not willing to, to pick up and, and fight for inflation, gas prices, climate change, voting rights, what are you willing to fight for? Now that you have more days behind you than you have ahead of you, when you think about your children and your grandchildren, 
And eventually, the children that your grandchildren are going to bear, what are you most afraid for them? Those are the things that we should be willing to fight for now. So, me, I'm a global thinker. I'm a retired administrator, so I think globally. And when I talk to young people, I say, this is the way I think, top down. I look at the issues. And I say, okay, let's get a plan together. You handle this, you handle that, you handle this, you handle that. We're going to reconvene. We're going to adjourn and we're going to reconvene. And we give you a time limit. And I tell you, I want you to touch base with me on this, that, and the other. It's called delegating. And there's a couple of people online here that work with me. I never say people work for me because I always work with people. I was charged to lead, but I lead by empowering other people to do what they do best. You put people in the job that they're excited about, you encourage them to do best, their best, and you let them go. And they tend to surprise themselves on some of the things that they accomplish. That's why a lot of people that worked for me 30 years ago still keep in contact with me now, regardless of what the, the job that I held. So that's how we think. That's how I think. That's how all of those things that my elders taught me, how it invades my consciousness and affects my decision-making process. Then I talk to these young people and they do what we call low-hanging fruit. They pick one or two issues. They don't listen to all the chatter, who did this and who said what and where we are and what the January 6th committee has come out with and what the attorney general in New York is saying about this and what the... They don't listen to all of that. They say, okay, I'm concerned about abortion. Who are those people that's going to make sure that a woman has the right to choose? Low-hanging fruit. They deal with issues. One, two, three. I'm concerned about quality of life. I want to make sure that I have student loans that don't plague me the rest of my life and that I can buy a house. So that's how they think. And I'm like, wow, okay. And then I'm reminded, I kind of felt that way when I was young as well. So I listened to my children more. I listened to some of my surrogate children. I listened to some of these young people. And I said, okay, we have to have a meeting of the minds. How do we incorporate, since you don't know the fears of the past, you take for granted that the luxuries that we call liberties that you have now, that you're automatically going to have them tomorrow. And you only worry about them when somebody take them away. Where I think about them proactively and I say, I want to not only make sure that I always have this liberty, but I want to make sure that this liberty is expanded upon so that it's adaptable to life when my grandchildren and my great grandchildren and I am no more. So how do we have this meeting in the mind? And they said, well, you fight the fight that way. And I said, the problem is, it's hard for me to get people my age to stay engaged. Because when I ask you, what are you willing to fight for? What are the issues that make you want to fight? When I ask you, why doesn't fear, these fear campaigns, this fear propaganda, why doesn't it work for Democrats? And why does it work so easily for Republicans? See, I, it's easy to answer the other part. It works so well for Republicans because it's 
like public enemy say, if you have a, a black planet, Just like Jimmy Carter, they fear the darkening, the blackening of America. So that's their fear. That's what forces them to stay engaged. What I feel, I fear those liberties that we take for granted being taken away, but even more so, I fear not being relevant. To, because I'm going to say this and then I'm gone. I am a heterosexual, straight black man. Now, I'm not going to qualify my, my statement by saying I have gay friends and I have this and I have that. I said what I said, I am a straight heterosexual black man. And when I look at the numbers, when I look at the number of black women who are fighting for issues that are not just for them, that react, as I said before, every time you say woman, they put on a shield and grab a shield, grab a sword, and they're ready to duel to the death. But when you talk about voting, Unfortunately, we don't fight until somebody said it's popular. Then we want to wear a t-shirt that said Black Lives Matter. If we fight to make sure that we are always relevant, if we fight to make sure that this place, that my Indian grandfather, and my slave grandfather lost a sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears for, then we'll always be relevant in our children's children and their children's children. We have a place in this melting pot that we call <laughs> America. To hell with democracy. When they said we the people in order to form a more perfect union, they call me three-fifths of a man. So I understand, young brother, young sister, young person, understand your argument when you say I'm fighting for a system that never factored me into the equation. No, I'm not fighting for the system. I'm fighting to make the system as broken as it is work for me. That's all I got for you tonight, folks. When I post it on my page, do me a favor, respond to it. Think about it for a minute. What is it you're willing to fight for? What is it you want to make sure that it, that special something, that X factor, that je ne sais quoi, that something, something that you want to make sure is here long after you are so that your children's children and their children's children will have these things that we take for granted. That's all I got for you tonight. Do me a favor, go to my YouTube, sign up. Go to my YouTube, sign up. Do me that favor, please. November 10th is my birthday. Have some old dude be kicking 63 in the butt. And all I want for my birthday is for y'all to go to YouTube and sign up and pass this message on because this is the stuff that should be going viral. Not this leg shaking, making R. Kelly rapist ass richer and richer. So every time I see this video, I'm saying, Lady, if you're sexy, <laughs> shaking your ass to our cow. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> this is the stuff that should be going viral, folks. This means something. See you next week, same place, same Baptiste time, same Baptiste place. My name is Hank Baptiste.
This is omit the logic. This shit makes no sense, but we're going to make it make sense every week. Thank you for tuning in. As always, important, I wish you love. I wish you peace. I like you, man. Hair grace. I'm out of here, people. Good night. Love you much. Ain't a damn thing you can do about it.